and this is Keynote, the daily now.tv chat show with some of the world's leading thinkers and writers. Hello everybody, it is Friday, July the 14th, 2023. I'm just back from the so-called Progress Summit that The Atlantic Magazine put on in Chicago as it happened. Um, I got diverted to Indianapolis, the fate that no one should experience, I don't, uh, because there was uh, a Chicago area tornado which evacuated the airport. Surprise, surprise. Uh, for all our progress, we're living in a perfect storm, according to the CNN, when it comes to the weather. Uh, heat, California, everywhere. The world is heating up. The story is a hell on earth, uh, at least in the context of um, Arizona's extreme hate wave. Everywhere is, is falling apart. We've had several records in terms of the planet seeing its hottest day a couple of weeks ago and then again last week. So how are we supposed to tell the story of supposed progress when it comes to the environment, when it comes to the crisis? We've done a number of shows on that. We had the environmental writers Kerry Arsenault and Bathsheba Demuth on telling about uh, their narrative programs at Brown University, teaching people how to tell the story. The Harvard academic Martin Puchner was on the show telling us that we need to reread the classics if we're going to understand our ability to tell the story of the environmental apocalypse. Uh, one other guest on the show, Aaron Sachs, argued in his new book, uh, Stay Cool, that we need to tell the story in terms of humor. It's a very dark humor. My guest today is telling the story with humor, but also with a, a hard historicism. Uh, David Lipsky's new book, The Parrot and the Igloo, Climate and the Science of Denial, is just out, and David is joining us from the studios of NBC, who have been kind enough to provide him with a green room in New York City. Uh, David, um, I assume you managed to get to New York. Uh, you didn't have any tornadoes. Hmm. This challenge of telling the story about our current, uh, shall we say, apocalyptic moment is the heart of the parrot and the igloo. Is that fair? That is fair. But, uh, and interestingly, when you were talking about Indianapolis, um, if you want to see how far, far we've traveled, we've known about climate change and, uh, and the effect of carbon dioxide warming for a very long time. But if you want to know the difference between uh, 19, let's say 68 and now, and between Indianapolis and New York, um, when uh, when Kurt Vonnegut Jr., he's one of the great reasons that we need Indianapolis since he's from there. Um, when he was starting sitting down to write Slaughterhouse-Five, uh, a friend of his asked kind of dismissively, uh, why would you want to write an anti-war book? You should write an anti-glacier book. And the idea is that war would be a, a, around for as long as glaciers would be around. And now right, saying you'd write an anti-glacier book, we, all of us, the entire culture, have together written an anti-glacier book. Your book has been described, or at least the marketing for the book describes it <laughs> as a real-life tragicomedy. Is that fair, David? Yeah. Like, um, how would you describe it? Uh, Time magazine, a uh, magazine I've always loved, is not the is not like an underground publication. And in 1956, uh, the person who became uh, the dean of American climate scientists, a man named Roger Revell, um, he told Time magazine that. Uh, there was every chance that in 50 years from 1956, uh, there would be a violent, uh, that the carbon dioxide buildup would have a violent effect on climate. And uh, he also speculated that salt water would run in the streets of New York City and London. And sure enough, with Hurricane Sandy, he was six years off. In 2012, uh, water came over, salt water came over the banks of the Hudson and flooded lower Manhattan and actually sent uh, the, the bottom half of the city into darkness. So the tragic comedy is we've known for a while, scientists kept saying, hey, this is going to happen, and we didn't act. Speaking of the it's Hudson, really David, uh, last week I was also, before I went to Chicago, I was in the Hudson Valley. Uh, and of course, that was 
flooded. How would you analyze the current situation? Sometimes I'm a little, uh, I'm a little nervous about every new event proves the apocalypse. How would you historicize the state of the environment in July 2023? Well, you may have seen me wince. Uh, okay, simplest thing is um, three ways to do it. Uh, first way is in about 1979, the government under a great president, Jimmy Carter, um, progressive president, he heard the facts about this. And so he asked for an expert second opinion. And he was told that uh, if we continued on this path, the scientists, they said this has been a short but intense study panel. And this, pet, this group finds no reason to think climate change won't result and no reason to believe those changes will be negligible. So part of, a, the, part of the reason there is just we had the, we had the data and we didn't act. But when, this, when the very same scientists would go, not in a report, but when they would go to lawmakers and they would say, hey, here's, here's how the science works. Here's what's going on the lawmakers would say, this is 1979, by the way, um, when is this going to happen? When will these effects be felt? Scientists thought it over and they said, give or take 40 years. And the lawmakers answered, get back to us in, get, get back to us in 39. So it's just the way um, many observers have said that, that uh, this is a problem which the way human beings are designed. Uh, there was a, a great economist at MIT who in 1995, which now is in the very far past, he said, if you wanted to design a problem that human institutions can't deal with, you couldn't create a better one than global warming. So the world that we're in now, the way I would characterize it, um, is the world that was predicted by us very ably by nearly every government scientist and by all the academic scientists in the late 70s is when a lot of stuff came together. And then especially in the 50s, more distantly by people who were sort of slightly more foresighted. Last thing I would say about how we should look at the climate now, um, you may have seen me wince, Andrew, when I said that, uh, that uh, Roger Revell was the dean of American climate scientists. Uh, the second dean and someone who I tremendously admire is uh, Dr. James Hansen. He used to be at Columbia. He retired about seven years ago. And he explained how weather works and what happens when we keep adding uh, carbon dioxide to climate. What he said was, it's like loading the dice. During the summer, you have normal dice. Uh, you know, we'll use not the delightful 20-sided dice, but just a normal up to 12 dice. And there's a one in 12 chance that you'll have a day that's over 90 degrees. And then as you add more carbon dioxide, you load the dice. It's not that you have a guarantee. Let's say you have two chances in 12 that you'll have an over 90 degree weather, or an over 90 degree day rather, right? So you still might get a cold one. But there's a there's now there's now twice as there's now twice as strong a chance. Then you keep loading the dice every half decade, and suddenly half the rolls will bring you a 90 degree day. And so every morning when I wake up and I go outside, and the street is like uh, a bathroom where five or six people have just taken a shower, I think, boy, Dr. Hansen really nailed it. You said earlier, David, that it's how we design, but. You mentioned Jimmy Carter was, in your language, an enlightened president, a progressive president. He got it. Al Gore got it. One of the people who figures very centrally in your book is a Republican, former Republican senator, oh, uh, Jim Inhofe, who explains the title. Is it just a certain kind of human who doesn't yes, get they, this? They, I mean, is it the Republican half of America? Uh, many politicians around the world, not just American politicians, get it. Um, a, a money, no offense to Senator James Mountain Inhofe, but uh, senators who are sitting in chairs made plump with fossil fuel money, I think it's so comfortable that they don't get up and open the window and see what the temperature is like. So it's very much that kind of person. Ralph Nade is an old friend of mine. He's been on the show. He exposed the corruption in the American automotive industry in the 1960s, reformed that. Lots of activists have reformed the American tobacco industry. Now more and more people are focused on the impact of technology on our on mental and physical health. It works sometimes, David. Why not with the environment? Well, there were tremendously, uh, tremendously effective, tremendously talented messengers who made a decision to 
mislead Americans. The funny thing is it didn't work on voters, but it did work on politicians or it gave them uh, an excuse. It gave them cover for not making strong decisions. Uh, but let me get back to, um, so I'd love to talk about the people who were so gifted that they stopped uh, action on this issue for 40 years. But one of the things that I noticed, if, if you remember, I remember going back to President Reagan, who is someone who I hated so much that um, when I was writing this book, I had to stop when I came to the Reagan chapters. And that's how I became a professor, because trying to write with an even tone about President Reagan was simply impossible uh, for me without, um, without central nervous system depressants. Um, but under President Reagan, I think that we, uh, our political sort of convincers, persuaders, distractors, they came to maturity. They achieved major league status. And so you might notice on a whole range of issues that we are able to state the arguments and we're able to bring people to the voting booths uh, with the various arguments, but they never quite get solved. And that can be good, clean fun. We sacrifice a certain number of people every year to gun control, right? Or lack of gun control. We can accept that. That's good, clean fun. Uh, stable, intelligent drug policy. People will come out to vote for and against. Good, clean fun. Abortion. We are still in 1973 on abortion. Problem is when you have something with like climate, which is accretive, where every year that you delay uh, means five, 10, 15 years to solve every year of delay. Um, so that's that to me is maybe the biggest answer, which is we became we used to be a culture that reached decisions and sort of now we're a culture that just considers and considers. And then we will hear all the arguments and we will move to reach a decision. And then, we'll, you know what, let's hear the arguments again. Does it ever feel that way to you, Andrew, that you came into the movie at this point on any number of issues five times before, 10 times before? Yeah, yeah. Let's stand back a little bit, David. Let, let's. Ex why don't you explain the parrot and the igloo uh, in the title? What, what you're trying to do in this book, and then let's talk more broadly about what the argument is about the science of denial, the history of the science of denial at the heart of your book. So, what the title means is, uh, in 1956, in the New York Times, there was a scientist named Gilbert Plass. And he looked at the numbers on uh, climate change, um, then called global warming, actually even then called the greenhouse effect. Uh, the basic science, basic science is sort of roughed out in 1824. Then uh, a great British scientist named uh, Tyndall um, has a very clear idea of what keeps our climate warm by the late 1850s. And in 1896, uh, a Swedish scientist who then headed the Nobel Institute, a man named Svante Arrhenius, he did the number. He just did the calculations. It took him about a year, sat down, uh, plotted out uh, with longitudinal lines and plotted out with uh, pencil and eraser uh, the numbers. If you raise carbon dioxide this much, how much will the climate warm? He said that they were the most tedious of his life's calculations. Then people began to notice that the earth was warming around that time. We had some of the first people saying, hey, this thing might be happening in the 1920s, 1930s. And then by 1956, there had been strange runs of weather all across the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, and a scientist named Gilbert Plass, who was a, a Navy scientist who worked also at Johns Hopkins, uh, he looked at the old data and he said, <clears throat> this is going to happen um, and it's likely that we will raise the temperature by 1.5 degrees centigrade before the turn of the next century. Uh, his guess turned out to be exactly right. He was covered in the New York Times in October of 1956. And the New York Times reporter said, you know, if he's right, um, the, the Arctic regions will be transformed into tropical jungles with... Um, with tigers prowling on the ground and gaudy parrots squawking from the trees. And so we had an idea about these parrots that we might be able to expect if we continued to not think about the fact that we were sending a heat trapping gas into the atmosphere. Um, however, the science, the science reporter for the Times, he ended the piece in a really funny way. He said, 
Look, the introduction of nuclear power, which doesn't excrete carbon dioxide, will, will likely make very little difference. Um, oil, uh, oil and coal are still cheap and they are likely to be burned throughout the earth as long as it remains, as long as it remains profitable to do so. And his guess was exactly right. However, we knew about the parrots in 1956. By 1979, uh, four big reports had told the White House that this was going to happen. One of them said uh, the climate will change in a way that is detrimental in the next few decades unless mitigating actions are taken immediately. Uh, the head of the, uh, the White House Council on Environmental Quality who released that report, he told the New York Times that he expected that report to be extremely influential in decision-making circles. Would you like to know how influential he was? Of course. Uh, he was. Uh, President Reagan, when he came in, immediately tried to shut down the White House Council on Environmental Quality. Um, and then by 2010, uh, after the deniers who become a deliberate force, a kind of uh, incredible commando squad, there are only, by their own count, their own head count, there are only about 25 of them. Um, by 2010, uh, Senator James Mountain Inhofe, his family visited the White House Mall on one of those days when, uh, when Professor Hansen's dice, loaded dice, but they came up the other way, and there had been very heavy snowfall in the winter of 2010 winter of 2009 to 2010, and his family built an igloo on the mall. And they put, um, they put a sign on the top saying, Al Gore's new home and honk if you love global warming. So the story that this book tells, and it was a really thrilling and very funny story to get to watch as the writer and a great story to get to tell. The story it tells is how we moved from the parrot to the igloo. It's your own particular uh, inconvenient truth. Are you suggesting, David, you mentioned that there's a, a handful of these climate deniers. Are you suggesting that this whole thing is a conspiracy on the part of a, of a tiny group of conspirators and the, 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 the industrial coal automotive uh, complex in America? Um, it's a conspiracy in plain sight. Um, so... The Times reported on this. The weird thing is that we've followed it. We've fought, we've uh, people like ourselves have followed it and reported on it exceptionally well. And in every poll, Americans have said we want to take action on this issue. Um, it's government that just they're so good at turning their people out, and we're so good at turning our people out uh, that has led to basically no result. But the conspiracy in 1992. Uh, Western Fuels and just the largest, they, they're a consortium of American coal producers, about $400 million then, so a large, a large interest. Western Fuel got together all the coal producers and they started a group and they stated aim in their planning documents was to reposition global warming as theory rather than fact. From 1956, Roger Revell and Gilbert Plass, until about 1992, we had had a sensible, a little bit delayed, but a sensible march. Scientists say it might be happening. They keep making the measurements. And in uh, January, in rather June of the late 80s, I think it's June of 1989, uh, Jim Hansen, this, that man who's sort of a, not sort of, who is a hero to me and I think is a hero to many people, he said, uh, the greenhouse, uh, the greenhouse effect, the signal has been detected and it is changing the climate now. And in 1992, the coal industry realized that this was what they would call an existential issue for the American coal-fired industry. And so they said, we have to reposition this as a theory rather than as fact. And they went out and they found three or four scientists then who were willing to go on the record to say, this isn't happening, it's not going to happen. And if it does happen, um, it's going to be good. It's going to be, uh, <laughs> it'll be warmer warmer winter nights and cooler summer days so we would have perpetual perpetual air conditioner weather outdoors and from 1992 till now their techniques got more and more sophisticated it was all pretty above board and it was devastatingly effective you mentioned that it, this is against popular opinion nobody wants this everyone sees the consequences tornadoes record heat floods and so on and, and so forth. Um, NADA made it work with 
uh, the car industry, the tobacco industry now is under assault. One perhaps darker analysis, David, is that people claim they want to address this, but they're not willing to give up their driving. They're not willing to give up their, commu- their, their, their consumer goods. They're not willing to compromise their lifestyle. Your narrative is very convenient for everyone. There's this tiny group of um, climate deniers who have been shaping and corrupting political opinion. <laughs> Don't we all have a degree of responsibility here, or can we blame everyone on these evil 15 climate deniers? First off, it's 25. Um, 25. Well, well reason, sorry about that. <laughs> um, 25 is their head count. Um, the reason I was laughing is that's in the book. Um, what I thought was it's very convenient, and those guys um, have been a magnet for, I think, I don't, it's hard to quote your own book from memory, but if you've written it as long as I have, you can get pretty close. Um, they've, they've served a great social good. They've been a magnet for condemnation, so the rest of us could go on with our smoky lives unrestricted. Um, I think that we can all say, hey, you guys are causing this, and it's your fault, and then we don't have to change. So that is the way I look at it too, Andrew, except that when you saw COVID, we were told that we had to stay indoors to protect the most vulnerable among us. We were told that we had to wear masks for two years, three years to protect the most vulnerable among us. We had to keep our kids from school to protect the the most vulnerable among us. And we were all willing to do it. Do you think having watched the global response to the pandemic, that people wouldn't take the steps necessary to begin to take the steps to address this problem. How unique is America in this? I mean, they've been very hostile, even sometimes progressive presidents in joining international agreements and coalitions. There's an endless debate about the Paris Accords and and other accords. Is America different in your analysis from the European countries, from Canada, from Australia, perhaps even from China in being willing to address this crisis? Uh, no, in fact, America, la- America as a group, not American voters, but American politicians have always lagged. Um, there have been different ways of doing it. For example, Europe signed on really quickly, but for kind of gross reasons. It was funny to talk about. Uh, there was a study that was done in the late 80s, and they were asking the question you're asking, which is why was this fairly easy to put across in Europe, but why has America not yet established a beachhead? And uh, one European minister said, even if people are, even if you have the worst voters, you can say to them, well, look, um, you don't care about doing anything about global warming. Um, if, uh, if it happens, and it happens the way we imagine it will, it will lead to sea level rise. And all the people from those lower lying areas, they will move to your city and they will move to your streets. So if you want to keep Europe European, you have to vote with us. Uh, a very gross way to make the case, but that way you could get European racists to uh, to vote for climate action. Um, we have been slower, and to the degree that there is a conspiracy, uh, the tobacco industry, uh, they were the among the earliest sponsors of the people who we know as the deniers. And the reason they were doing it was one of those things, um, if you're in a relationship, uh, a business relationship or a family relationship, and you want to get someone to look bad, you point out the other things they're wrong on to show maybe they're wrong on the thing that you care about. Uh, The tobacco industry wanted people to be allowed to smoke in offices and in restaurants in the early 90s, same time the coal industry was mounting their first assault. And the decision they reached was, um, if we can make it look like science in general, that the EPA is wrong about global warming and ozone, then people will think, oh, they're wrong on, uh, on how the climate is going to change. Maybe they're wrong about whether we can smoke in your face in a movie theater. And they began to support the people who we know as the denial all-stars. One of the really brilliant lawyers for Philip Morris, he was giving a speech uh, which led to the strategy in 1987. And he said, most cultures have, most Western cultures have an adversarial, uh, an adversarial political approach but America has the most extreme version of adversarial culture. Anytime you have position A, instantly you have position Z. And that for me was part of the fun of titling the book, The Parrot and the Igloo, because that gentleman was great at his job, knew how to exploit the fact that Americans will always argue 
from the farthest side of every issue. And he knew he could use that to make Americans doubt climate change, then doubt, uh, doubt the very scientists who were saying the climate would change, and thus doubt their fellow scientists who were saying, could be cigarettes are bad for your throat and your lungs. David, your day job is, uh, or your day job has been uh, as a reporter on the Rolling Stone. You've written a uh, number of best-selling books, including um, Absolutely American. And um, although, of course, you end up becoming yourself a book about your road trip with David Foster Wallace. So you're an experienced writer of stories, and that's the core narrative in the book. It's a very accessible book, a very important book. How much in terms of this story are you integrating this climate crisis with the history of 20th century science? You, you, you write about Nikolai Tesla, uh, Thomas Edison, um, George Westinghouse in the book. Is your book in, in some sense a, a critique of the history of 20th century science, of technology that this is inevitably from from Tesla and Edison and Westinghouse. We get to that tornado in O'Hare, which diverted me to Indianapolis. Uh, no, but let, let me let me apologize on behalf of uh, the Middle West for your bad your bad experience in flight. Um, and you guys may have seen me smiling. I loved writing about uh, those inventors from the from the second half of the nineteenth century. Um, the book is about 500 pages. It's meant to be a thrilling story. It is an extremely funny story. I, uh, I love the Coen brothers. And so I kept thinking. Dark humor mean? then. It's yeah, the Fargo, exactly. for, uh, Fargo exactly. for the environment. Yeah. Um, but I kept thinking, how would the Coen brothers tell the story? And it was easy because Earth is telling this story the way the Coen brothers would tell the story. Um, but uh, yeah, I started, you know, I started when the inventors uh, created the ability for us, created the ability for us, my God, um, created the ability for us to rely on electricity, uh, changed everything and um, led in a very clear way to the trouble that we're having with climate. Um, Edison was the longest lived of those three gentlemen whose faces you showed. Uh, Tesla and Westinghouse both, oddly enough, died in hotels. Um, no, I take it back. Tesla actually outlasted Edison. But Edison was being called to celebrate the Golden Jubilee, 50th, 50th anniversary of electric light, which really meant electricity in everybody's homes. Uh, the electric light was the killer app, as Steve Jobs would have said, for electricity, American electricity. Everybody is patting him on the back. He himself, by the way, had slightly bad vibes, and he didn't want to go into the banquet hall where President Hoover and Madame Curie and the heads of all of America's biggest corporations were waiting to toast him. Uh, Edison, I think, was 84 by then, and he sat outside the hall, and he said, I won't go in, and he cried. And his wife brought him um, a glass of warm milk, and then he rallied and went in. I've always been moved by his not wanting to go in to celebrate this. Um, anyway, everyone is clapping him on the back verbally, and uh, from, a, from a complicated radio hookup from Berlin, where Albert Einstein was doing physics research, he had the only note of caution. He said, uh, there are many great creators of technics, that was the word for tech back then, of whom you are the most accomplished. They have placed mankind in an utterly new situation to which humankind has not at all adapted itself yet. And that's where we are. We have not, we have yet to adapt ourselves to it. We have sped up what we can do. We can go from uh, we, uh, barring a tornado, we can go from O'Hare to New York in two hours, would have taken 17 days uh, by skateboard. Um, we have sped it up, but we have not, we still, the equation of speed it up, but sell away the weather in the future, that still seems like a good deal to us. We don't know, we haven't accommodated ourselves yet to what the technology does for us and what it costs us. David, that's where we are. I'm quoting you. We had Erin uh, Brockovich on the show a couple of years ago. She had a book out back then, Superman's Not Coming, Our National Water Crisis, and what we the people can do about it. What can we the people do about this? Superman isn't coming, although we've had people on the show suggesting that new technologies of wind and solar can address some of these issues. Uh, so a, a two-part question for you. 
are there new technologies that can address this? And, and secondly, what can we, the people, ordinary people do in response to this existential crisis? Uh, I think it's a voting issue. Um, do you know, um, do you remember that famous uh, Indian, it was called the crying Indian. I hate to use a word like Indian, but it was a very, a very famous ad from when I was a kid. Do you remember it? It was No, uh, I, I grew up in England, so I don't think oh, I No, but it was, it's the most famous ad in American history. Uh, what historians say, um, uh, a first uh, a Native American looks at trash being thrown out of cars. Uh, someone throws trash right at his moccasined feet. It's a very corny ad. And the camera pulls in tight and we see him shed one tear. And media historians say that it's the most famous tear visibly shed in history. So I thought news of it might even have gotten across uh, across the Atlantic. Um, that that ad was hugely motivating for generations of American kids, made them police their parents' litter and their neighbors' litter, made them say, no, you can't throw a tissue on the ground. You can't throw uh, a newspaper on the ground or a candy wrapper on the ground um, because we're all responsible for pollution. Um, it turned out that that ad was created and filmed. The Indian himself, the Native American himself, was an Italian-American actor. He was a fake, and the organization was a fake. Uh, the organization Keep America Beautiful was actually the beverage and packing industry. It was the people who make cans for Coca-Cola and for Coors, and they didn't want there to be recycling bills. They didn't want to have to create glass and plastic and uh, an aluminum that could be easily recycled. And so they shifted it from pollution is our responsibility. We're the ones making the money and we're the ones kicking out the smoke to your responsibility. People start pollution was the motto of that organization and people can stop it. If you play that backwards, what it says is it's up to you. And that was that's one of the ways that climate change has been argued uh, is that it's, it's something that we can change with our personal behaviors and market choices. But when people like Al Gore or uh, brilliant uh, editorialists and economists like Tom Friedman, when they sit down, what they say is what we have to change. You know, one of the things that we were told was not to stop litter, um, but to change our light bulbs. And what uh, former Vice President Gore and Tom Friedman said at Davos in 2007, when the IPCC, that's the World Science Organization that has been verifying that climate change is caused by people. Um, what they both said is we have to change our laws and our leaders, not our light bulbs, because shifting to us the idea that it's up to you and me and the people watching this podcast, that it's they who can solve this problem. That's a way to make it so Exxon and the Republican Party don't have to act in a way that will allow favorable, hospitable weather for generations after the generation after this one. But even Joe Biden, who, who at least Biden is, is the Biden is a hero. He's the first president since Carter. We've known about this since Lyndon Johnson put it in a State of the Union speech. Nixon was aware of it. His domestic policy advisor, Moynihan, told him this is going to happen. Um, everyone has tried, not the Republicans. Everyone has tried. And then there was always something that had to be done. There was an affair. Right. Or there was a war. Uh, or there was a financial meltdown in 2007, or there was the need for health care, only President Biden was able to get a bill through. So whatever else people, some progressives I know are disappointed. Sorry to interrupt, but this is something I feel really strongly about. Only President Biden, all these other presidents talked about it. Even the second President Bush talked about it. He's the only one capable of slaying the dragon, of getting a serious thing through Congress. So before you say even President Biden, just say pre even President Biden, the only American president since 1979 who's gotten anything on the books about that. So you think that re-electing Biden could address some of the, the crises that you write about in The Parrot and the Igloo? Um, I think that he is, the, uh, he is the only person who has gotten in the ring with the difficulties that we seem to have had in this country with passing effective legislation and walked out carrying the thing's head, right? He got it passed. Uh, no one else did. Um, some presidents had the choice to do health care or, um, or climate change, and they chose health care. So, yeah. What, what is the science of denial, David? How are, how, how are the scientists of denial, the 25 you, you write about in the book, 
how are they dealing with all these these headlines about the perfect storm uh the unbearability <laughs> of, of 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 life in phoenix some of them probably live in phoenix uh, how, how are they addressing the the quant the quantities <laughs> of realities of the uh, climate in 2023 um... I'm sorry because you can see my very negative feelings about them. Uh, the two most effective died, so um, so they didn't have to worry. Um, but uh, as it became more clear, um, do you know do you know who James Dellingpole is uh, in England? Yeah, great. And do you know uh, do you know? I love the way you said yeah. And do you know Chris Monkton, the scientist? I don't even know what to call Christopher Moncton. If you could get a picture of Christopher Moncton in his pith helmet with his eyebrows up, that would be great for our viewers. Um, but what Christopher Moncton said, you know, um, liars can adapt to the new story. So if they say it's not going to happen and then you show them Phoenix, uh, you show them the tornado that, uh, that kept you on the tarmac uh, longer than was convenient. Um, if you show them that, then they say, you know what? It would... Uh, it's still too expensive to make the change. Uh, and so what Moncton said, okay, it's going to happen, but it's better to sit back, relax, and enjoy the sunshine. So we know what they would say. I, I just, I wouldn't call Moncton a scientist. Um, the other, the, 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 the great team captains of denial, they always had good reason. They had some who, who is fi Who is financing Moncton? Uh, Gina Reinhardt uh, from Australia, who is a coal baron, he gets a huge amount of his money from them. Uh, a, a group called Friends of Science um, in uh, in Canada uh, would support him when he toured Canada. Uh, when he would tour America, the George Marshall Institute, which was run by Frederick Seitz, who was the great overall team captain of the deniers, uh, they would all find ways to get him money. But Gina Reinhardt probably is his biggest funding source. And final question. There's so much here, uh, David, and uh, perhaps we come back on the show again, talk more oh, about it. We've had lots of shows about the responsibility, quote unquote, of American industry. American industry is addressing injustices of one kind or another, or at least claiming to. What about American car companies, for example, or, or the airlines? They claim to be developing uh, carbon neutral ways of flying. Is it conceivable that reform will come from within uh, the dominant industrial sector of American capitalism? Uh, that's always been the idea was that if you forced uh, American capital was able to reconfigure very quickly. This is the metaphor people always use, but it was able to reconfigure very quickly in 1941 when we entered uh, the war to resist European fascism. And if there were a national program that we have to get this done, if, uh, if industry was forced to, the idea, the sense has always been that they would come up with solutions very quickly. Um, we can see that once Tesla was able to make, um, to make electric cars a fetish item, a fetish luxury item, people would brag about their electric cars. So it can be done. The, the question, what we have to do is change the incentives. Um, when you say you have to do this, American industry finds ways. But when you say you don't have to do this, then they find excuses. Their ingenuity goes not to products, but to explanations for why they can't act. 